On this show, we talk about how we can help out our local bodies of water. And I'm happy to announce that we are only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting our very own 501c3 nonprofit, Casting for Conservation. Our mission with Casting for Conservation will be helping supplementally fish stock local bodies of water that could use the help. Whether it's stocking smallmouth bass in a river that's had a major fish kill or potentially adding F1 largemouth to the Potomac River to help improve catch rates. Furthermore, Casting for Conservation will also be seeking to help out with boat ramp facility restoration. There are so many boat ramps and facilities in this area that really could use some love. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. They'll receive a percentage off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle. 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Rods. Members will receive membership-only content, access to our private Facebook community. They'll be entered to monthly fishing photo contest giveaways. And starting in October, we're going to be doing online fishing tournaments as well. Please, if you feel like supporting, we're only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting casting for conservation. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV. With your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. I'm so sorry that I wasn't here last week. I actually had to do something called a vacation, apparently, is what my wife said as I'm reading the script in front of her. Uh, First vacation, uh, I took her on in about three to four years, and I had the shakes. I absolutely hated it in that sense because... I am apparently a workaholic, um, but I did actually get to go saltwater fishing again. And I realized that there's not just bass that you can catch and redfish and frounder are really, really cool to fish for. But we're back into the swing of things here. We have the BFL Super Tournaments. The James River is completely done. We also had the, um, I don't even know, like the Elite 70s, like, like big send off that chad won two weekends ago chad will be actually the guest for monday night live next week as well and then you had the bfl super tournament one and two that i have at least one of the winners uh booked for coming up in the next i think week or two that when that's going to happen so many episodes this week is going to be a little light on episodes because i literally just got back this morning and i'm editing videos like a madman but next week we're going to have like four or five episodes dropping as well I know you guys don't care about that. The biggest thing is the guests. We have a great show. Uh, I do have to do this big plug, which is the nonprofit. We are going live in 2025, casting for conservation. Our biggest thing is supplemental fish stocking in our region and also working on the docks and amenities that you all fish. There are a lot of shitty boat ramps and docks out there. I want to start helping fixing up some of these projects and also F1 stocking in the Potomac River, smallmouth for all my river rats out there on the Shenandoah, the James. These are things that we need to do. It used to be done by the people and we're bringing it back. So that's coming in 2025. If you want more information, check out Patreon. All right, plug is over. All right, so first up in here, because we got a star studded cast, the man, the myth, the legend, the one that really helped put this thing together, Tyler of High Pole Guide Service. Here he is. Tyler, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. No. Um, oh, you hear? can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I was getting a little bit of like a buzzing noise. I don't know if it was my phone or not. Um, But yeah, no, thanks for having me. No, I'm glad to be here. Um, I know we're the first thing I know we have some other guests on. uh, And I just want to kind of talk about the the backstory real quick about Hypo Guide Service. I won't take too much time. But um, yeah, where we are now is is very different. So kind of the the, a few people know this and a few of the clients know this. when we started this, when I started this, this was just like, really, it was just a dream. Um, it, it honestly reminds me of like a little boy, like, I'm just going to go fishing. I'm going to do that. So the backstory of it, I left a great job to start this, like a very good job, had a lot of things, and I just left it high and dry. Um, and really, I just was like, I'm going to build this fishing business. And it was scary. A lot of it was very scary. Uh, put my due diligence in. Um, I spent a lot of time out there. Uh, really when I didn't want to be long days, 13 hour days, not getting paid, losing money constantly, starting a business, not really knowing what I was doing. I have a background in marketing and and sales. So I had that with me, but really, I mean, there were times where I couldn't pay for shit. There was times where it was bad and I made it look a little bit better than what it was. 
because I had this dream and I uh, and I just stuck with it. So that is kind of like the backstory of it is it wasn't just like willy nilly. I'm going to go start a business for shits and giggles like it was tough. It was really, really, really tough. And to get it to where it is at now and the two other guests we're going to have on is honestly, it makes me a little emotional even thinking that I I got it to this point and I had a lot of people help me get along the way. And Thomas, you're one of those people. Absolutely. Um, for the first year, dude, I don't even know how many bookings that they said we heard from you on Fishing the DMV. So I wanted to say to you in front of everyone how grateful I am and how grateful the business is because you helped us tremendously. And I don't even think you understand how much you helped us. Um, but yeah, dude, like honestly, that that got me out because of you and your recommendations. I was able to make payments on things. I was able to keep the business alive, to grow it and get it to this point now where the trajectory has been insane. We're year over year. Um you know, I'd, obviously I won't get into numbers, but quad, quadruple, mm -hmm. like just exploding and having so many return clients, clients invested and wanting to go out, clients booking trips months and months in advance, clients booking like five trips in the one lump sum, um, you know, people getting on phone calls with us uh, just to do follow up calls and go over the lake. And that's because what I offered and the complaints that I heard that people had with other guides is I made damn sure that that wasn't going to be me because I gave up everything that I had going at one point to do this, to help people catch fish. Um, so this business is near and dear to my heart and the two other people on here, I wouldn't have brought on unless I saw potential. And one of them, Matt, Matt Schreichel, everyone knows SB Fishing. Uh, he is probably the nicest guy that I've ever met. I've heard and that. And that is how I want my clients to be treated. And he stands for everything. And Timmy is young, ambitious, and a fantastic fisherman that a lot of people can learn a lot of stuff from it. And I saw that very early on. So I just want you to know, Thomas, how thankful I am. And these two to know that I believe in them. And I know that they're going to do a damn good job. And, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't something that you can necessarily have as like your full-time career, but it it's a it's a really good way to mm -hmm. to you know provide great value and make some money doing things that you love uh so that that's kind of the backstory and i'm just i'm super grateful to have them too i'm super grateful for you and man it it, it was a hard hard year uh i, I lost a lot to mm -hmm. get to this point and, and do all this and a lot of it wasn't possible without the fishing the dmv the community uh and then bringing on these two and me kind of stepping back as I have a new job now um, that I'm going to take time off. But I'll never be away from the business. I'll always be the first person that my return clients can go to. And I'm still doing trip. I love guiding. I absolutely love it. So, like, on the weekends, like, I just got done. I, I work a 60-hour week. And on Saturday, I guided two people because um, I love it. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. Uh, but with these two, they're fantastic. And there's a lot that you can learn from them. I'm really happy to have them on. Um, but yeah, that's that was pretty much my spiel. Passion and vision can't be taught. And it's something that people either have or they don't. And this is whether it's starting a guide service or thinking that like somebody would like one an iPhone someday. And that was something that I really recognized with you with I've talked to a few people, um, and a lot of people are bullshitters. They just are. And it's this idea where I think you transcend your field when you don't worry about the little things. Like I'm afraid of blowing my spot up. When you yeah. get so good at fishing or baseball or anything where that doesn't matter anymore because you're thinking at a, I, I think like you're thinking at a higher level, basically. That's where it's like, oh, this person's figured it out. This person's got it. Where that stuff doesn't matter because you're so good or your skill level or whatever is so good that, that those little things don't matter. And that was something that I really recognized in you initially. And I get the passion it takes to do a small business. Um, and yeah. yeah, it's, it's a hard thing that a lot of people don't appreciate that wants to keep that corporate job. But dude, we all live, we all die. We got to work as might as well do something fun with it. Right. And yeah. And, and then just a, another thing too, because a, a lot of this stuff is and the community has been, been great. And that's why we, and we're going to keep doing that, like offering those free youth fishing clinics. Like we've gone out with a lot of people, like we want to give back to the community uh, for free 
for free at my expense. If I have to pay for it, we're going to continue to get back to the community. Um, you know, we, you know, we have nothing but good things to say. You know, there has been a few, a few rough things said. You know, there's been some, some sub tweets like there's it's the internet. Girls from, from other guide businesses, and yeah. that's unfortunate. We're never going to snoop to that level, but if they feel they have to do that, that's fine. We've had other guides go by to go out on trips with us and then start their own businesses. Uh, and as my mom likes to say, imitation is the best form of flattery. So we'll mm -hmm. leave it at that. And other than that, we are going to do what we do, and that's provide our clients the best service, not bullshit them. And we're going to help them catch fish, and we're going to give back to the community. With that said, I am going to bring in the next guy here. Uh, he knows about the dream, the man with the van. It's just what I'm going <laughs> to try to make that a thing. You all know him. How you doing, uh, boss? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm living the dream. Good? Living the dream. I didn't know you were on vacation. I was wondering why the chat has been quiet the last week, but yeah, it all makes sense yeah. now. The wife said if I didn't like cut that down, like there was there were some things you don't break. So, you know, I, I did my piece. Fair enough. Fair enough. I respect it. But yeah, just got back from Norman, fished the English Choice uh, tournaments there Saturday and Sunday with HPS Fishing. I've heard of him. Did pretty well. Yeah, he's famous, dude. He's sponsored. <laughs> We um yeah we finished we had like a 16th and a fourth place so it's like the highest finish for us fishing as a team which is awesome and yeah it was a great weekend in Norman flipping jigs fl flipping shallow it was sick you had a great coach yeah yeah of course pay a lot pay, I pay extra for that so but besides you you having to donate so much money to the salary of your full time uh, professional fishing coach how how did you how did this whole relationship really come to be where you were like, Hey, listen, I travel around living in a van doing my <laughs> dream. And then I also want to add guiding into the mix. Like, like I, before we get Tyler into it, your thoughts before <clears throat> that, that conversation. Sure. So it actually came at like the most hilarious time where like every winter when making videos slows down a bit for me, I've, thought for like the last three, four years, I'm like, I need to start looking into guiding at least through fall and winter so I can make a little extra money and just give myself more of a reason to be out there. And like the pressure, not pressure, but like knowing someone else is going to be at the ramp waiting for me to take out fishing is what gets me going. Sometimes it's hard to be self-motivated through November, December, January, when it's getting really, really cold and you're like, ah, I hope they're biting. Like I just, it, it helps having someone else in the boat to take out and like try to put on fish. So the other side of that is over the last seven, eight years of getting heavily back into fishing, I've fished with, you know, 30 plus new people a year. So maybe not, I, I don't have any formal guiding experience, but I look at any time I take someone else out, I want them to have a better time than I'm having. Like, I don't even care if I'm catching fish. I just want to see fish get in the boat. So, um, Tyler texted me like a, a month ago. He was like, Hey, would you be interested in picking up any guide trips? And I was like, dude, this is insane. Like he read my mind. So it was perfect timing. Cause you are a great, and I, and I know in like the, the social media around this always sometimes is a negative connotation, but you're a great entertainer and it's not just like on the camera, but like in person, you truly want to be a good host, you know, in a boat guys, if you don't know, cause the whole co-angler debate was so saucy the last few weeks, when you own a boat or any kind of craft, it's idea like this is your home, this is your house. And there are some people that are not great hosts and there are other people that really do enjoy, like you're coming into my home. I want to make sure I treat you good. and I want to show you a good time. And a hundred percent, I can talk to that with you. Yeah, that, that's 100% the thing. It's like you want people that come into your house to have a great experience. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And it's, I don't know, it's just somehow like something I've always looked at with high importance of like having someone else come into the boat with me and fish. Like I, I just want them to have a better time than I'm going to have. And usually it ends up that everyone's having a good time. But, you know, it's just how I've always looked at it. Tyler, how did that conversation go down? 
was it a, like a 1 a 1 a.m. text simple. or it was like a one text deal done and we, yeah. we also fished together uh in june july when did we yeah go i july? think it was in june or, or or late may yeah 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 we fished together um me and matt have known each other for a while um eight years yeah Seven like eight years? years or so um yeah. and i when i i knew him as like a fan and to be honest I went through a period when I first knew Matt that I was like, I didn't know if I even wanted to keep fishing. And he actually like motivated me because I saw what he was doing. Cause I was a tournament angler. I grew up a tournament angler. I've been fishing tournaments since I was like 12 years old. And I got kind of like tired of it. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I saw he was making content and I went through like a period where I was like, yeah, yeah this is cool. Wanted to make videos and like mess around with fishing, nowhere near the production or quality of what he's doing. But I was like, I'm gonna, I'll just do this, and it was fun and I enjoyed it. Um, so that was kind of how I met him, and then we had always like stay co connected. And um, Matt actually uh, helped me, and like when I was at Tech doing, uh, I was doing, I don't know if you remember this, Matt, but I was in college and I had to interview somebody who was in like the media world. And everyone was like interviewing these like corporate media people. And I was like, fuck I do that. remember this now. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, fuck that. I'm interviewing SB Fishing TV. Yeah. So I, interviewed, I totally uh, forgot about that till just yeah. now. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that and he like helped me out with that. And uh, and then we fished like a few, a handful of times before that. And we fished again in, in Anna for the first time in a, in a long time. Um, and then what I was thinking, you know, there was a, and that was the first person I had on my mind to ask because I knew what I was, what was about to go in my life and how I was kind of pulling back from it in a sense. Um, but Matt embodied everything. Again, like I said, his attitude. Everyone that knows him knows that he has a great attitude. He's super welcoming. Uh, he has more experience on various bodies of water than I'd say probably anybody in the state. Like there might be a few people, but I don't think as many people fish all over like he does as consistently as he does um he can catch them you know he can catch them on anna he can catch them on chesden he can catch them on the rivers he can catch them on lake norman uh he can teach people a lot he can catch them on the res i i, I forgot that he can absolutely catch them on the res too um so and, and so many other places so people are going to learn a lot from him and that is really what the guide business has come to be we're more of an educational service and you're going to catch fish but we're going to teach you stuff that other people aren't willing to teach you or just don't have the knowledge to teach you because of the experience and the time on the water. I want to talk about that too. And, but I also want to make sure that I don't leave the next guest out for two hours. So we'll bring him in and I'll be coming <laughs> back to that. So the next guest that we have is, uh, I, y'all called him Timmy. So I'm just gonna go with Timmy Big and Timmy. nice full title. Big Timmy. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How about you? Okay, so you know the deal from listening in. So how did you get into this crazy uh, scheme? <laughs> so, I mean, I've been tournament fishing. I think I started the junior high school fishing, I think in eighth grade, and that just kind of opened me up to where I'm at now. And like Matt said, or Tyler said, I have uh, I went through a little lull there where I'd fished all high school, done that, and then it kind of just hit me where I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do this as much, and then – I got to speaking with Tyler and then we kind of just got back into it. And now I've just been basically fishing tournaments every single weekend. Yeah. And I think all, actually all of us this week, you know, we, uh, we got a check on Anna this week, every single guide here on the tournament. I'm pretty sure. I don't know if they paid on the Tuesday. I don't know, but I know Timmy and Matt got second and fourth and then me and McCluskey got um, fifth or six, six yesterday. So, you know, we're, we're out there and, and fishing derbies and doing well, too. McCluskey, come yeah, on, bump up those numbers. Tuesday. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, he, McCluskey, I hope he's watching. He made me run up. He made me run up the river. I don't run up the river. But, <laughs> but hey, we didn't have live scope all day yesterday. And we, the biggest fish that we caught, no live scope. We weren't cheating. What? And he caught a fish? I caught it on, a, I caught it, caught it on a chatterbait, no live scope. I, 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 so I, I can catch it. fish without live scope, too. Wow. 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 Tim, what were you saying? Oh, no, I didn't really use live scope either. I pretty much was just fishing grass and that's how I got paid. I wasn't even using it. 
I, what do you think, and, and this is something that's really interesting, like like from at the stage of your career, when you're looking at getting into the guide business, I know it can get a little frustrating when it's like, do you, how much information do you give? What can you learn from guiding? One thing that I've heard from several guides I've had on the show is the difference about when you're pre-fishing for a tournament, it's I'm looking for five bites versus when you're guiding, well, I just need to get these clients on fish sometimes, depending on the guy that I have. Does that really factor into just kind of the decisions that you're going to be making? Yeah, it, it, it's a client by client basis. You can feel it out. Some people are very dedicated um, and they don't mind. I'm going to say, look, do you want to catch? If I know they're good at fishing and they and the conversations that we have leading up to it, um, and I don't mean good at fishing in the sense that people are bad at it, but people that have more experience fishing, um, I'll just ask them. I'll be like, look, we can go try to just catch some giants. It's going to be a grind. I can't guarantee anything. Or I can go put you on a pile of fish. And you have to feel it out. Some people just want to get bites. Some people want to catch fish. It's fun. It's fun as shit catching a bunch of one, two, and three pounders. It's fun. Uh, that's how you just have to feel it out on a client by client basis and talking to them a little bit beforehand and getting a feel for it. Um, I'd say 80%. It's hard to quantify. People just want to catch fish. Uh, they don't even care. Some people will catch a hybrid and it's awesome. Hybrid fight. Great. You'll catch an occasional striper and they love it. It's awesome. Um, we're at the end of the day, you know, our goal is to put you on fish and teach you things and just feeling it out. But yeah, I have some return clients where their goal is they just want to catch big ones and you have to get in that mindset and have that conversation with them. Like, look, we can, we're just going to go target big ones. I can't guarantee anything, but this is how I catch the big ones. And this is the best way that I think it is just to catch big ones. Um, so I, I think you really just have to feel it out. And then there's times of the year. I think everyone can attest to where it doesn't really matter because uh, you, you're around, you know, smaller ones just as much as you're around big ones. Uh, there's obviously when they're up shallow early in the year or even and my favorite time of the year is May and June out there because, I mean, hmm. it, the fish are all grouped up together. The big ones are where the littler ones are and there's little things you can do to get bigger bites. Um but you still have a chance to to catch like some really big ones doing the same thing that you would do to get, you know, some two pounders to bite. You talked about earlier, and I wanted to make sure I hit on this before the ADHD medication wore off, which is about education and really teaching your clients. And at least from my perspective, where I really try to just talk to grassroots people in the area, it's this nervousness of not talking. And I had somebody say, I can't come on the show and talk to you, but I'm going to tell you, I caught him in like Matter Woman. It's like, dude, that's a massive creek. Why couldn't you say that on the show? It's like, well, I didn't want to blow up my spot. It's like, I'm going to give you a spoiler here. That's not a spot when you talk about the whole creek. But that is a thing in fishing where it's like, if, if I tell them I caught it on black and blue, I've lost my ability to catch fish and I might as well sell everything. And then you came into this thing where it's like, I'm going to teach people how to fish. And all of a sudden people like, like you and stuff but then there's also this weird conflict on youtube where it's like oh you're just giving away the secrets and back in my day during world war one it's like we didn't do all this stuff it's like uh, could you kind of explain that because it, it's so important where like that educational aspect if you're comfortable enough in your own skin that's the evolution of any person in any profession is you get good enough and confident that you're you can teach the next generation yeah absolutely i, I mean if you spend enough time on the water, you, you know this. Um, and that's the thing where a, a spot on most lakes, there, there are some great spots that can be good, like 365 days a year and they're rarities. And I bring people there. Um, and again, you have to understand a lot of the clients that are coming out with us, man, these guys get to fish like 10 times a year. They just want to go catch fish. You know, that's, and they're paying me to, to help them with that. So I'm not going to lie to them. Um, you, you know, we've had a, a recent, and I'm not going to name a name, but we had a story where we, uh, you know, one of the services that we offer on a follow-up thing is doing like a follow-up breakdown for different seasons, uh, different times of the year. And we price that based on how many spots they want for that year. And then we go very, very in-depth on that. And he goes, oh, well, I paid uh, this, this amount of money for 80 waypoints one time. And then... The only response I had in my head was, then why are you coming to me? Because mm -hmm. if those 80 waypoints were so good, then you wouldn't be coming to me if you were paying for 80 waypoints for that money. So 
you have to be willing to actually give people. I promise you, if you're paying whatever this dollar amount was for 80 waypoints, that's some bullshit. And some of them were probably like, I caught a fish there in 2010 on a, on a spinner bait, and it was just a random thing. Where that's not what it is. You've got to be able to help these people understand the basics of breaking down on a map in seasonal progressions so that they can go out there. And yeah, they're going to have those spots you showed them. But if you give them a little bit of information, they're going to be able to go throughout the lake and find their own spots. And fish change so much. Like, you know, me and Timmy, uh, I mean, and Matt fishes out there a lot now too, but me and Timmy can tell you <clears throat> We could tell you like where the mother load is and then you could go there in a week and they're not going to be there or they're not going to bite or they slid off a little bit. Um, so what we're trying to do is preemptively when we go out there is show them where fish are currently and then explain what they're going to do and where they're going to move and why they're going to do it and why you got to keep searching. And that goes a, a lot through mapping. I know live scope is the big thing, but if you can read a map, you can find fish any time of the year. And that's like the biggest thing I go through on my breakdown trips is, mm. is mapping and why the fish are there. Um, and you just have to be open and honest. If you're not open and honest, people are going to catch on to it. You know, people aren't dumb. They're going to they're going to figure that out. And I'm, I'm not worried about it burning up spots. It's never been that. I, I, I will say, honestly, it makes tournaments can make tournaments hard if you're booked out six days a week and then you're fishing a tournament on sunday because your mind is set on where you helped all these clients go and you know all these spots and then on sunday you're like you know clients have been through it and all that but that's just part of it chris um, johnson talked about that who does guiding on uh, the potomac river and talked about like when you just guide like a lot because that's like how he makes his living and then you switch to tournament it's like you have to switch your brain on like what you're looking yeah. for and he said like that's really hard and i never thought of that before un until he says like oh yeah i didn't think about that when your brain is okay i need to find spots that only have like a, a good quantity of fish but then it's like you have to switch and be like oh i need five bites that could be hard yeah 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 it, and it can be hard and and I don't know how many times and, you know, some people don't, won't realize it. Some people will not realize what you're showing them. Um, I've showed people things that like take a long, long time to find. And, and again, like you show them that spot and you tell them how you catch them and you try to show them the best that you can and try to help them catch them in that time. But like at the end of the day, like, most of these people that are going out with us, they're not there for bad intentions. Like these are people with busy, busy schedules with families that are only going to be able to fish there, you know, 10 times a year. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, I just think honesty and, and guiding is the best policy and being dishonest is not going to get you anywhere. And people are going to catch on really quick. Matt, what is something that you've really learned about how you can study and break down water? Well, like we were talking about earlier before we started the show, um, even beyond just your standard topographical map or staring at your graph map on there, um, I go as far as even looking at Google Earth Pro, like on the computer where you can go back through multiple years of satellite imagery. And I usually will send it back as far as I can with the cleanest picture and mm -hmm. look for the lowest point um, where there's a satellite image of the water being low, so you can see more of the bank. And obviously this is going to help if you have a clear body of water too, because you can see a little bit more, you can see deeper into the water. But even from this trip to Norman that we just had, like, I think that it, it absolutely helped. It kind of put us in an area because of something I saw on there. And we went off of that, but multiple tournaments in the past, I've done well because of using Google Earth and looking back at like low water points and finding rock piles or like big brush piles, stuff like that. And it's really paid off for me, but it is also something that you have to spend a lot of time staring at the computer doing. And then marking it on the graph for your active captain and going that route. What is something that your coach has really taught you that snunk in? Coach Hunter has taught me <laughs> just catch them, man. Just catch them. Limit dues are where it's at, and you just flip a jig to shallow brick flats, and you just catch big ones. 
And then, guys, as always, best question tonight will win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle, and also you'll win a coaching session with Hunter or HP Fishing, potentially, maybe. Um, Timmy, uh, b- b- back to you. What is something that, like, what is a big highlight from you this year, you think, that stuck out in your mind? Probably, honestly, I took out a father and a son about a month and a half ago, and before it, I had never known, but they had never caught a bass before, ever. And, That's crazy, um, man. Yeah. And I, I took him to this one spot, and the son was throwing a drop shot, and he caught one that was probably 10 inches. And I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a nice one. And uh, he was thrilled by it. And uh, he told me that it was the first ever bass that he's caught, which was crazy to me. And it was an awesome experience just to be there with him and his dad and seeing how happy his dad was watching him catch that fish. And it was actually his dad's first time catching the bass too. So just all around good experience. And then I got a comment here on Instagram. McCluskey said commenting on YouTube or Facebook is beneath him. So I can't share it, but he said fifth, uh, fifth place is unacceptable. And it was my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say fifth place McCluskey. That, that's I, definitely not right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, he's definitely. We did we did catch our our biggest fish of the day going up there, but me up the river, man, I don't, I can't do. I will it. say if y'all finish fifth, I got fourth. Y'all are right behind me. We it was fifth or I don't know, man, fifth or sixth. We were like the second or third to last check. We got a great question here, Tyler. What is the biggest bass your clients have caught on your charter? This year, six and a half pounds. Um, Six and a half, it was a PB. We've had multiple PBs this year, a lot of PBs. Um, but six and a half this year, and then last year, I want to say, I had a lot fewer trips my first year. I want to say it was right at that six-pound mark, too. Uh, what's for Anna? That's it's a big fish. It's a, it's a big fish. I only, as much as I fish it um, during all those different times of the year, I mean, I usually catch just a handful that are over, that are six and over. Uh, this year, I caught... One that was eight and a half. That was like probably the biggest fish I've caught in Anna. The year before that, I caught one on eight. Uh, that was eight mm. pounds too. Um, and then usually catch like one or two sevens and then a few sixes. So anything that's five and over on Anna, it's a big fish. Yeah. Uh, Odenkirk said 2026 and beyond is really when you're going to start seeing those F1 starting to play. Uh, so it's interesting to see that the 30 pound sack that happened three years, two years ago, that was all Northern strain. There was no F ones then. So it's crazy to think what Lake Anna will be in a couple of years. Uh, we got Josh, uh, Torres on Instagram again, guys, if you want your comments shared on the stream, please go to Facebook or YouTube because Streamyard sucks and it won't let me share Instagram or Twitter. Josh says there's grass on Lake Anna. Um, yeah, yes, there's a lot of grass this year. There is. Yeah, it's um, full of grass. Because I've, got, chock full. I've gotten yelled at by the HOA at Lake Anna, and I've got yelled at by, I think, CC, and I've got yelled at by Alabama's HOA. That was a fun conversation on vacation. Um, they are thinking about putting extra grass carp and spraying Lake Anna. So make sure if you guys are fishermen, please email them and talk to them about that, about not doing that, because this grass is good for the fishery, believe it or not. It's also like the least invasive yeah. grass I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, yeah, like it's not like hydrillas in there and it's clogging people's jet skis and it's like annoying to swim in. Like you got to almost fish for it or graph for it. Yeah. At least for the stuff that I've seen. No, you're right. And when I said chock full, I'm talking like Anna standards, which is mm-hmm. not that much. So no, it's, it's definitely good. Yeah. Like there's it's, areas yeah. where you go down you're like, damn, there's a lot of grass right here. I, and, yeah, it, and that's how rising amount. We, were, we were catching all of our fish pretty much targeting grass. I know Timmy did the same was they're in the grass because they like it and it's a good natural filter, but we don't need grass carp or chemicals. The grass carp thing. Yeah, I got one picture from uh, Sunday. One, I think I showed Tyler. Yeah, I mean, its mouth is full of grass, just bright green grass. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is like, because I last week when I was pre fishing for a kayak tournament, I took my boat because, of course, why would you not pre fish with that? But I went to Mooney with Scope finally and I got into a pot of grass carp. It was like, it was insane. It looked like tarpon. And I talked to a local there and like, well, yeah, because it's like, it's for this, this, and this. And I was like, just shut the heck up. Like this is literally, this is why it looks like a carpet there at Mooney. It's because the grass has not been able to actually grow into clumps. And it's a shame because 
the grass is the only thing that you really have there besides the five trees that you can find out in the middle of nowhere. That place is like has ah, no shoreline ah. cover and grass would make that place better. I don't want to get into that whole debate because that's for another show, but it's just, yeah, we need SAV in certain places and the questions are flooding in. So we're going to go right here with Scott Bowers. With Anna being a power plant lake, when does the fall bite start? When is the veterans tournament? But anyway, um, take that one. I would say for me, I mean, Timmy and, and Matt could weigh in on this too, but I would say for me, it's definitely later in the year than most lakes, uh, depending on where you are, especially like, the mid and dam section, I would say the fish are starting to act a little fall like right now, just because we've had a really cool nights and cool mornings. Um, but yeah, it can take a while to get like that real true fall by I me mean, talk late October, November, that sort of thing when the water actually starts to turn. Um, so yeah, I think it drags on a little later at Anna for sure. I mean, even in like December last year, I, I mean, I was catching fish like dirt shallow in December and the water was in the 50s. I'm glad this is brought up because this is something Chris Gorsuch talked about, I think it was a year ago uh, when I had him down. He was a big time Tuscaloosa guy. He said, like, don't listen to Bassmaster. He said, Bassmaster will say fall starts in like September because that's when they start writing articles about fall fishing. He's like, I've had years where fall fishing didn't start on the Susquehanna until December because of the weather. Yeah. And that's important because I remember the one year, well, it was last year, <laughs> Matt and I actually fished together uh, at... And, and the fishing was fantastic. It really was good. The weights were really good for the Veterans Day tournament there. Huge shot to Larry who did it. Um, that's weird. Carly? Carly. Started throwing a crankbait, and of course, with that hour left of the tournament, when I go up there, they start biting. And then, of course, I didn't. I don't think I weighed my fish in that day because I knew I wasn't going to win anything. I went out there the next day, and I think I had like fifteen and a half, and got second the next day on Jeez. the fish down lake. It's just, it's crazy how they just turn on and turn off so quick. Yeah. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, my Wi-Fi router kicked in. My backup. Sorry about that. No idea what happened. Continue your story, so I don't interrupt you. Oh no, we were continuing yours. We were talking about the Veterans State tournament. It, it, it's just the fact that like. We, when I grew up, spoiler, no one in my family fishes. I was the first person to fish. I grew up in Vienna, Virginia. I think that's where you were like waiting bars, Matt. Like, so I, I literally had to read magazines and stuff to like figure stuff out. And it was like, oh, like Bassmaster said, you have to throw a six inch swim bait. So I like, I tie on a Bastrix that I bought and then I threw it in a pond. I was like, this is shit. It doesn't work. <laughs> and, and it took me a while to click in like, oh, Bassmaster is very specific to some places. And it takes a while once you fish a bunch to be like, just because this is the norm, it doesn't mean it applies. And the fall transition, you know, it really is like Kerr Lake. When I fished regionals way back in the day, November was the time you want to go to Kerr because that place would start popping again. But the fall bite there was terrible. Like, but I think that was because that was like the early fall transition versus like the hard yeah. fall feed. My hypothesis is this. The further south you go, it extends that fall window out. So it's not it's not a hard feed bite versus when you're at like Deep Creek Lake in Maryland or you go up north where it's like in two weeks, it's going to be ice over. And those fish immediately are like they're eating hard. But when you go from like, I think like mid Virginia down, that window gets so extended. It takes a while for them to really want to start feeding up for the winter. Yeah. I, uh oh, I was going to say. Yeah, he's gone again. Oh, I was going to say that he's back. That I agree. I agree with you too. And especially like speaking relative to Anna, is like these fish are still like every summer pattern. But what they do in Anna, and again, like whatever, spoiler, it's not really like if you go out there, um, the late summer bite when the grass comes up, the main lake grass and the midsection, the down section, that's where those fish go. And like 
they move up shallow. Like one again, fish love grass that holds bait, holds oxygen. Um, if you get and they came up a lot quicker this year and had that shallow bite because it was so hot. I think they were looking for oxygenated water, um, but you can still go out there and catch them deep, like summertime pattern, and that that's going to drag out for at least like another month. Like you're still going to be able to find like some offshore fish on some summer holes out there, but you can also go. You can beat the bank right now. I mean, you can run up the river, beat the bank. You can fish main lake shallow grass on flats and different spots where there's grass. Um, so, not, like, you don't really get, like, there's not, like, a start date. It's not like they're like, okay, it's the first day of fall, pumpkin spice lattes, the fish are going to the backs of the creek and chasing bait. Like, it, it's not like that pretty much anywhere, I'd say, unless, like, you said you go up north. But Anna is definitely not like that at all. It's like way. It's almost like the spawn, like where there's like waves where they move up and mm-hmm. do that. Uh, I think that's kind of how the fall is on Anna too. And that was weird too in the spring because I think I talked to. I'm getting old, but I talked to you and somebody else, and it's like, well, this is when the spawn generically should be. And I went down there for a three day event for Antietam Bassmasters, and it's like, bitch, there ain't nobody on beds right now. And then like, everyone's like, oh yeah, like it happened quick because of the warm up. And that was something Billy Cole's talking about Smith. Like the spring here was so freaking weird. It was like, it happened so, it was so abrupt. It wasn't the subtle transition. And from Smith all the way up here, the weather affects it. And this is where you gotta just get out on the water. Like it's not just a fishing report, no matter what we say, you gotta get on the water just to actually see what's going on. And we got Michael here with a really good uh, question. Uh, what bait are you mostly, I can read. What bait are you most likely to put in a client's hand when the bite is tough? Uh, drop for shot me, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Shot. Uh, drop shot uh, and drop shot top water or uh, a swim bait, like a little swim bait on a jig head. If the bite's tough, those those three can can generate bites on Anna if the bite is tough. And I know McCluskey loves a Ned rig, so I'm just going to say that for him since he's not here to defend himself. Uh, we got another question here. Uh, anybody- yeah, he couldn't put that sucker down yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to get shit from him. I don't care. Uh, we got Michael here. Uh, Lake Anna's grass is full of bass, but fall bass fishing due to the transition tends to be harder. Do your favorite early in the day or later in the day during the fall? Do you prefer early or late in the day for the fall transition? Uh, that's a good question. I prefer, um, it's weird too. Me and McCluskey were having this conversation yesterday. So like in the summer, I like hate the morning bite. Like everyone thinks like, oh, like in the morning, like blah, blah, blah. Like it, you got to go early cause it's so hot. But like, I like like that nine o'clock. Like I want that sun to come up where the fish are, fish are positioning a little bit better. And then in the fall, I will say that I prefer the morning bite. To be honest, I, I like that early morning bite in the fall. Um, so maybe a little, a little opposite of what people think. I think like there's a tendency to think if it's cold, the air temperature is cold. As the day warms up, the bite's going to get better. And sometimes that can be true in like the dead of winter. But um, I almost think of it the, rever- the reverse. Like summer, I like later in the day when they're set up personally. And then in the fall, I like early morning. And this is something else that like again. I have these weird tantrums probably because my autism here thinking about these questions where I think what really triggers the fall transition is light because what happens is the vegetation dies. And I think there's some time between September and October when the light slowly gets less in the day that tells the fish or the bait, whatever it's time to make the roll because we've had a couple of Indian summers where it was like 80 to 90 degrees into October, but there's still that time period there where like they still know it's time to make the change and pull away from the grass. Um, Potomac is weird because you get mats and they'll still be in there, but a lot of places when that grass starts to die, they do start to evacuate those areas. Let's see. We got this one here. Uh, I thought the fall bite started when they started selling pumpkin spice, everything do not get my wife started on that. Uh, let's see. I got another question here. Anybody fish hunting run res? I fish there a few times. How about you, Thomas? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hot. I know uh, Shane Flynn outdoors. He caught like a thirty-two pound bag on a spinnerbait this past spring. That out there, like there again, those places are loaded. It, Mooney is the hot, sexy yeah. woman right now. I don't know why it just is, and that's fine because I think it just it means nowhere else gets pressure. But there's so many lakes down there; it's insane. Yeah. Um, I think we've got another question coming in here. Uh, here we go. Randy, do you guys think September is the hardest time of year to fish? I have to love it. I'd say they're biting pretty good right now. 
it is it's surprisingly good but i will say uh, in the past september's always been my least favorite month to fish yeah it's, like, it's a weird transition it's like not fall yet it's late summer it's starting to cool down but the they're kind of everywhere and not eating it's just weird but the bite's actually been pretty good so we'll say september is september last year is when i caught the biggest fish i've ever caught on anna how big i didn't have a scale to weigh it but tyler you've seen it's the one where i'm wearing the blue hat that that I, i'd say it's around seven or eight it was a giant big fish but yeah i i'd agree with with what matt said like i'd say historically like september is is tough like they're biting on anna right now but like the weights always go down like i mean you might have like some top heavy bags in the tournament but like the weights just go down in, in september and the bite yeah. does get tough it seems harder to get big bites i will say that like obviously you can have a unicorn you know and get that big bite but i just think the big fish in september can be a little bit trickier uh to get bites on September is the month where if you have the ability, that's when you go for smallmouth on like the Shenandoah, Tomax, those places, they just start popping for some reason. I don't know why, but that's also why like an Otifo will run up into Lake Douglas into the creeks and catch them because they start clicking on about that time. So I'm spoiled where I just kind of transition and I just start chasing brown ones a little bit more until it gets cold out and they start getting the feedback on. Uh, we do have a couple of qu we have a question on Instagram here from two reels dot coal. What type of bait do I use and where do I use it on high tide on the chick? That is oddly specific, sir. That's a Matt and Timmy question. I mean, I'll probably say a drop shot again, or if you want to get ballsy, you can go throw a mag draft at the dam if the tide's right. Yeah, that top water throw frog around and all the pads and way back in the hydrilla that's we need to phone a friend for that one we need to call hunter yeah HPS, coach. my fishing coat yeah coach where are you at actually so we can actually get this going here but um i mean i'll just say from the potomac stuff there it's punching will work good depending on if you have mats available to you i'm pretty sure that's how the guy named todd probably caught him too was uh flipping and punching on the potomac so that's a really good good strategy as well. Uh, let's see, we got another question here from Shane Flynn Outdoors. I find that when the vegetation starts to die is when I find it hard to get bites. Do any of you experience the same? And that's because of oxygen depletion, by the way. When grass dies, it actually, it pulls oxygen out of the water. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I yeah, it, it definitely is tougher when the grass is starting to die to get bites. Um, I would Honestly, when it starts to die, when you really see it dying, that's usually when I'm like sliding off into a ditch or yeah. something. Like if I have like a pocket or there's like a back creek and there's grass that's leading into it, that's when I'm sliding off into the ditch and not really focusing on the grass as much. Yeah, I'd probably agree too. And if you can find one section, like one little area, grass is still alive, it's going to be loaded. Yep. Yeah. And then that's where I think you got to cover water because it's forward facing sonar. Mick Jesus probably knows this, but you can't tell if it's alive or dead on forward facing center. You have to snag it. And that's where I think a, a, a lipless bait or something like that, where you can cover water and actually snag some of it to pull it up as green really does help. And then you can find those secret holes. But in general, this is where it's nice to have, like if you're not fishing tournaments to have a couple of flavors of lake where, okay, this is a grass lake. I'm going to fish this in the summertime. And then I can go to like a cur or something like that. That has nothing basically in the thing in the fall and fish that and you can kind of bounce around to like all the different hot places i'm swear to god like everything is not working on my setup today that is crazy um, back from vacation i know right I'm, I've, I've lost the ability to do anything uh we got we got steven lloyd fishing what's everyone's opinion on how kerr is going to fish this weekend oh lord hopefully good because i'll be there i haven't been there in a while yeah i haven't been there in like two years like when you yeah, see when i'm down that way i'm fishing gaston so from the episode I pre-recorded uh, from a local, it's probably going to take 15 to 16 pounds to win, and it'll probably take nine pounds to cash a check because it's Kerr. And it's getting better, right. though, I think. Right, Matt? Like, the fishing is, in theory, getting better weight-wise, but it's just really small increments. Yeah, I think it's it's getting better. For I will say I also have a slightly limited experience of fishing out there. It's really been over the last two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. But over those three years, I've seen it slowly get better. Could be, I guess, 
from slightly learning it, obviously the, from my own standpoint, but um, yeah, I think that's what won the super tournament last year, the same weekend it was like 15 or 16 pounds a day, maybe 16, 17 pounds a day. Um, and Derek Hudson won that one. Derek Hudson won that one. And yeah. I, I'm still waiting for somebody to actually run up into the Roanoke river. Cause I keep having people on the show and apparently no one goes past that bridge. So either there's not a single fish up there or someone's going to win. Election. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll run up there this week. Check it out. Unless... What tournament's up there this weekend? It's the BFL Super Tournament for the Piedmont Division. I like how the Super Tournament is just two tournaments back to back. No, I think this one's a... Wait, what do you mean? Is it actually a legit Super Tournament? The Potomac one was like just two back to back tournaments that they called it a tournament, like a Super Tournament. I think there was a reason for that. Was it a reason? Sure. I think it might have been. I'm not 100%, okay. but I can say that I remember last year the Super was like a two days. Super. Like okay. If you made top 40, then you got to fish day two, maybe, or top 20. Okay, I don't want to get I don't want to give MLF shit just for no reason. So apparently, I that I could be off there. Um, and I could be too. Maybe they changed the the ruling on it. That is how English Choice does their events. So it's, it's two like two back to back, oh. two single hmm. set like a single Saturday, single Sunday. And I think it's they're great because that gives you the opportunity to fish in it if you are busy one day a weekend or you can only fish one day. Yeah. So kind of cool. That's that is pretty cool. Um, uh, Scott Bowers says, anyone hear how the Potomac Northeast BFL was won? This will be a quick comment because uh, his name is Alex Johnson. He's actually called in. He calls into almost every call in show. He's from Jersey. He won the thing and he will be on the show. I think Wednesday night we're doing a recording for the show, but he's going to talk about that whole deal about how he won that, which is pretty cool. And there's another yes. guy that won as well. Uh, we've had him on the show a couple of times. I'm buttering him up to get him on. Hopefully. So <laughs> I think once the check clears, he'll be out there. Uh, Sammy says, what bait color is the best on the chick or the James? Tilapia. Hey, Marjorie nice. mutilator is good. Matt, the, you once, yeah, no, she posted this on your Instagram. You caught a crab. Well, you didn't catch the crab. The bass caught the crab, but then you caught the bass. But the pat, like, is there a crab pattern there on the James? It's funny you say that. I'm like fixing to go film a video out there of like just using crab lures. Oh, that's cool. Like hell. blue crab imitating lures to see if it works. But the legit ones, like the saltwater crab from Savage Gear, just to try it. Have you? It might be too good. I might not be able to post it. Have you shot it already? No, I haven't even tried it yet. Uh, but I will say, no, back in June, I fished like a Thursday derby and weighed in and I was like grabbing the cull tags out of the live well or something. And I noticed like a big blue crab. I was like, what the hell? I didn't have any big fish. I think the biggest was, I mean, maybe three and a half pounds, but the crab just seemed way too big for the fish to even attempt to eat. But it definitely wasn't the first time that I've, or I guess that was the first time that I had a crab in my live well. But since then it's probably happened two or three more times. And Actually, I think there's still one in there probably right now. I need to clean out. But uh, yeah, it was big, like, you know, four or five inches across. Dude, they're really opportunistic feeders. Like they will eat anything. And I really noticed like on the upper bay, because it's closer to me, like the bass there develop almost like fangs. Like their teeth get so freaking hard. And you know, like that's because of what they're chewing on. Let's see. I got another good question here. I think I answered. Uh, I have a question for all of you guys. What do you fish when you have no wind, <clears throat> high blue skies, and slick calm water on a Thursday? I added that last part. Um, um it, I would fish. I mean, if, if in those conditions this time of year, there, I mean, there's a dock bite. You can go fish shaded docks. Um, if you're scoping, I'm looking for isolated targets, brush piles, rock piles. You know isolated grass clumps something like that something that they can hold to um but depending on the time of the year too they'll, they'll still be active fish chasing bait high bluebird skies and, and all that don't let like the conditions necessarily like deter you if you do get high bluebird skies like yeah traditionally it can make it seem harder but you know shade lines docks and if you're scoping look for isolated cover that fish are sitting on all right, and we got a question here for Timmy. Timmy, have you ever experienced losing your fishing net in the lake while taking kids out fishing? 
Yes. That, <laughs> that, sounds, that, that sounds targeted. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a targeted yeah, question I, I for sure. That is. No, he's referring – I had a big one on, and he got off right before than that. But I actually have experienced that with clients. Um, the, one day I had two sons and a dad out, and I had the son caught – I'd probably say a four and a half. And um, it was pretty small in there moving into the back of a creek. The big ones were just – they were just floating around. We were just live scoping them. And uh, the son caught like a four, and the dad hooked up with one. I, I'll just say it was probably a high five, six, if not bigger. And it jumped off right before the net. Yeah, I've had that. Any Anybody who fishes that much will tell you that they've had plenty of fish jump off before they get in the net. Yeah, uh, HB yeah. Fishing, if you're listening, we would love to get a net seminar because I do need to work on my netting for my co too as well. That's so see. good. I had a bunch of fish break my nets this year and they'd get in the net and break it and swim through them. Mm. Uh One of the best client stories I have this summer was like super nice family. It was uh, a mom, dad and their son. And uh, they they, they were just, uh, they they were like, they were just super kind, like really nice. And we're fishing, um, we're fishing some grass. This was only, this might have been like a month ago now, probably like a month or less ago now. We're fishing some grass on a flat and they're, I mean, they're catching them. Like they're catching them pretty good. And like, they're just throwing like swim baits and, uh, and some top water and the kid, he hooks up with one and I knew it was big right away and he's fighting it all the way. And like, I'm trying to coach him, like do all that. And he's just like having a good time. Like, Oh, it's on. Gets it to the boat. The biggest fish that I saw I've seen on Anna this whole year, like not even kidding. Like my mouth was like, I was like, Holy shit. I get it. He gets it right up to the boat. I this thing was eight, eight pounds plus, like massive, like a weird, just massive fish, a unicorn for August. Comes up, jumps at the boat, shakes it, swims off, and the kid just goes, "That was awesome!" And I was, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, thank you, buddy, thank you, buddy," because there's a lot of there's some grown men that would be cussing right now. Hey, leader touch. Yeah, I was like, yeah, we got the leader touch. He was just like, that was sweet, and like just kept fishing, and I was like, whoo, <laughs> like thank, because that could have gone all sorts of ways, but uh, it was good at it. Uh, it was good at it. Oh, we got okay, Michael. I'm going to save that question for a little bit later in the show for more of the after hour segment. Uh, we got Jamie here though. Uh, Michael, I saw some needlefish on the Susquehanna. Yeah, the saltwater intrusion, guys. Like depending on like what tidal fishery you're fishing, like that's something to keep in mind is like the saltwater intrusion. Uh, we got rush to fish. How, how you think Smith Mountain Lake will set up at end of October? I read that perfect. Top water, top water, top water. All right, there we go. Uh, glide be, glide be, glide be. I was waiting for that. And I actually had, you know, that's a great, great question here. Let me see. Both. Uh, Matt, are there any natural cues that let you know the fall glide bait bite is firing? Like temp, tree color, anything? Fish biting it. <laughs> Honestly, like, I'm serious. It sounds ridiculous. But like throwing a glide, yes. you're going to get them to follow it they're going to follow it just out of pure curiosity yeah i've learned that i throw it every hard. time i go out sorry so what did you say oh no i was just gonna say i learned that the hard lesson this year like i caught my first glide fish on anna thanks to matt like we went out one day and like i saw like what they were doing when he was throwing that thing like i mean he's he's good with it i'm i'm no expert or anything but he get he left me with one and i think all i did for like two weeks was just throw that thing and I saw so many fish fought. Like, you, when you see the draw power on that thing, you're, like, mind blown. And I finally had one just train wreck it, dude. And I was, like, shaking and, like, <laughs> and like it was, like, the best fish catch. It was, like, I'll, I'll catch, like, a four or five pounder now. And this is unfortunate. And I'm still, like, okay, cool. Like, neat. And, like, whatever. But, like, this fish, like, just train wrecked it. And it just got, like, my adrenaline pumping and everything. So, but, yeah, the, the draw power on it is incredible. Yeah. It is. It it just ta it takes the eat. You like throw it from now until it gets cold, cold. I mean, like into the dead of winter. Even then, it'll work. But there's a window probably when the water gets, I'll say, slightly below sixty, like upper fifty, even in the sixties. We'll say okay, mid sixties and down, where you will find a window on whatever body of water you're fishing that the glide bite will turn on and it's 
stupid. It is some of the most fun fishing you'll ever experience, in my opinion. Yeah, I didn't believe it until I was in that boat with a guy called Phil. God rest his soul, rest in peace. But um, <laughs> when he caught, I was like 28 pounds in front of the boat. And I was like, holy Christ. And it was like a 13 inch freaking piece of like hardware. And they were choking it. It was insane. It was absolutely insane. Um, here we go. Sponsorship plug right here. Matt, what glide bait do you recommend? I fish up fish everything. Um, TS7 and TS10. It's just some of my favorite baits to throw around right there. Is that the seven? That's the, no, that's a 10. That's a 10. Yeah. And I fish the white or the albino. I think that's what, or the blank, whatever they call the blank, it. I think. Um, it's really all you need. And I think it works in all watercolor as well, whether it's crystal clear or it, I think it looks better in dirty water. That's just me, but great swimming glide easy to use and they're easy to manipulate to kind of make mm -hmm. them do what you want them to do like if you need to sink it down a little bit they have these chambers built in you just pop the pin out you can slide weights into so like if i'm trying to catch fish in 15 feet on a brush pile you can weight it down so it sinks a little bit quicker and you can pop them out if you're fishing lay downs on the bank where it keeps it way higher up in the water column where you don't want it sinking quick. So what type of weights just, do you like to insert? Yeah. Drop shot weights usually, or oh. like a, a tungsten nail weight. Hmm. I have no mm -hmm. idea. That's actually a really good idea. Yeah. I need to pull up to, uh, to one of the res ways in with some cash and get some off old boy. Cause I, I, I want some of those for the fall. I need to get some from them. They're good. I mean, yeah, favorite glide for sure. I will say I'm going to like the smallest version he makes will wreck the shit out of smallmouth. I had some of the best days pre-fishing because, of course, I caught like 18 pounds on the Shenandoah with that small like six inch one he makes. Like it's insane how it smokes it. It doesn't work in the tournament, of course, but it's <laughs> I, you do have to match the size. But like smallmouth will truck one when you get it, you know, custom to them. Um, let's see. You got a couple more questions. We got so many good ones here. Okay. Okay. That one there. We got, already got that one there. Uh, let's see. I think we did this one here. Question calm. So good. Yep. We did that one there and here we go here. Uh, have you guys tried the Nessie or the call shack? Ooh. Okay. The Nessie, the Nessie works on Lake Anna, but I hate it. And <laughs> the coal shad, uh, just throw the, throw the mega bass version of it. In my opinion, personally, that's my opinion. Um, I don't, the mag draft. I don't know why. So, and the Nessie, I caught fish on Anna, uh, this year on it, but like it breaks after you catch like one fish. So what's more important, the size or the action? Hmm. It's a good question. Uh, for me, I would say for my experience. So I know that Matt saw this when we fished last time. For me, it was the action because the Nessie, I could burn it really, really fast. fast. Uh, and get them to react to that way. So for me, it was just, it was probably a combination of the both, but for me, it was just the action of the fact that I could burn it really, really fast, close to the surface and get them to react to it. Like, like I do with a fluke out there uh, in like May, June. I agree with that too. Just in general, across the board, I think action is more important than size because even when you start throwing glides in general, you're like, you get your first six inch glide bait. You're like, this thing is stupid big like nothing's gonna eat this it's gonna take like a it's gonna take like a seven pounder to eat this and you start catching two pounders or like a pound and a half fish on it you're like okay damn maybe i'll throw a little bigger one and like get into that throw a 10 inch glide and you're like wow i can catch two pounders on this this is what it's all about the action and like making it do what you want it to do according to the fish's kind of mood i guess mm makes a lot of sense we got uh we got b cal uh we got what rod are you using i'm uh, throwing first, oh, yeah, let's go ahead go ahead tyler no you're good you oh i was just gonna say because i like matt was is definitely gonna have a better answer for you than that but i throw uh shimano zodius seven nine extra heavy and then another shimano zodius like seven four heavy uh whenever i'm throwing like bigger baits but if you're talking about the nessie i don't know if you're talking about the nessie you can throw like a chatterbait mm -hmm. rod 
like a graphite tatter bait rod, like a medium heavy seven two or something. You don't need anything crazy for that bait. Unless you're throwing like the massive one, maybe you want to go a little bit heavier. Yeah, even the bigger one, uh, I think it's a the nine inch Nessie. It's really not. I think it's like two ounces or an ounce and a half, maybe. It's really not like overly heavy, so I, you could get away with like a flip and stick throw on that thing if you if that's what you had, you know, you'd be perfectly fine. Yeah, and I also like find a rod that you can multitask. I personally think, personal opinion, multitask with because I know some. I like to also chase. I'm trying to start chasing more musky and stuff. I'm getting addicted to that and the pike thing this 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 winter. Find a rod that you can do both with because a glide bait rod should be able to hopefully be transient towards that as well. Uh, oh, here's a juicy question. And Timmy, I'm going to start with you here on this one. I'm going to pick on you. Have you ever had to guide for a Karen or a Kyle? <laughs> Not particularly. I mean, they've been pretty good. I'd probably say the worst thing I've had to deal with is just... Uh, people not listening honestly and almost getting hooks like in lodged in my face or head or anything nope. but i mean that comes with them not fishing that much but i haven't had the, any bad experiences so far tyler i know you give us some juice uh yeah yeah i mean <laughs> everyone's great <laughs> <laughs> like i mean i'm not gonna like of course you get it but like i, I will say like more than 90 percent of everyone you get is really great the most like i wouldn't not to pick on like a specific instance or anything but i guess like the hardest thing is like you don't control the fish as much as you want to and i guess the frustrating thing too with live scope fishing as a guide is you like you were like, oh, if you just casted like two foot to the left, you would have caught that fish three foot. And it's our like our job as guides to help them get better at that throughout the day. So they're making more accurate casts and they know how to line it up. Um, and then I'd say like the other thing is like people like not understanding like truly what you're showing them or how good it is or how good it could be, but it might not like produce great that day especially like during a breakdown trip. So, you know, obviously it's results driven. Like you have to show, you have to put fish in the boat and you have to be, you know, welcoming and really help them learn everything. But, you know, some people don't necessarily understand like the juice that you're showing them and they might get like a bad taste in their mouth because you're like, Oh, this, like this spot is so great. Like that's one thing I've learned. Like you never want to talk about how great a spot is before you go there. And you never want to like oversell or anything on what it is because it's fishing. It's, it's hard to do. That's just the truth of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I would say like people just not really understanding what you're showing them. And then like, sometimes you will have days where you're like, Oh, like we could have had like a 30 fish day, but like just the cast accuracy, like wasn't quite there. Because like all, all of us will, will tell you, I know these two will tell you like, Sometimes you don't hit them in the head, they're not going to bite. Or if you don't position it or know where they're moving to, they're not going to bite. Uh, so, it, you know, that can be some of some of the more frustrating stuff, but not like in a bad way where you're like angry. It just it puts more pressure on you to like really try to get them to understand like where you need to cast and how accurate you truly need to be to get them to bite. Or like seeing what you can throw, that's the easiest for them to throw and understand and make the fish mm -hmm. want to eat it too if they can't. Yeah, because like exactly yeah, you got to do. Yeah, like what he said. Like some days, like I know that I could catch them fishing a bait that's just not quite up to par with their experience level. And we teach them like the the biggest fish that we caught uh, that I caught on my boat on a trip this year. That was the first time that that person ever used that bait. So I do give them a chance with baits that are I would say like a little bit more advanced than just like a beginner bait. Um, but you also have to be able to adapt and give them things that are going to get bites and going to produce more. But like all of us could say, there's certain baits that like, for example, like a jig, it's hard to give a client a jig and lock a jig into their hand. Like it would be hard to lock a, a giant swim bait into a client's hand. Like there, there's certain baits. I mean, I've given people the giant top water I throw and sometimes it works and it's not like that's a super hard bait 
too too fish but Mm -hmm. people get will get intimidated by things like that and not really believe it sometimes you have to show them so like when that's on for example when i have that top water bites on i'll start throwing it to show them because they like don't believe they think it's like a striper bait or like it's for salt water so i'll catch one on it to show them to give them confidence and then switch them over to it that and after five casts your arm is on fire after throwing that big thing yeah that's true if you're not used to throwing that thing all day i mean it's like a like you're it, it does it gives you a workout no guys that that's really really great stuff um you know, I, I didn't want, I don't want this to be like a, a massive 10 hour long epilogue here. So really, do we have closing thoughts? Anyone wanted to start with here? Tyler. Uh, closing yeah, thoughts. So closing thoughts. Book up with these boys because they're going to teach you a lot of good stuff. They have a lot of experience, um, you know, and that's, it's been one of the, the harder things, uh, for me is because I've grown a lot of like relationships with some of my clients. Some of them I would call friends and some have been good, but they're going to start going out on trips with these guys. And I know that they're going to do a great job and you guys are going to learn a lot going out with them and see some really cool stuff. These are some damn good fishermen with a lot of experience. And I'm really excited for them to be guiding under hypo guide service. And like, I'm just, I'm grateful for them. I'm looking forward to it. And I know that anyone that books with us is going to have a great experience. And yeah. And thank you, Thomas. Nah, I'm just a guy that talks. That's all it is. Um, You guys are the ones that are actually out on the water fishing. You guys also mentioned, I want to make sure that this gets hit. If you don't want to get on the water, but you want an educational standpoint, do you just go to the website? If you want to do like a phone call or just teaching people how to use live scope, like how does that work? Yeah, so what we're going to do, like all three of us um, are still going to do, like I'll I'll still have availability, but we offer a breakdown trip. It's been one of our our best trips, our most favorite trips. A lot of people come, you know, go on those trips and then send pictures afterwards of like, man, look, I caught them. Um, We've had people go on those trips and then like fish their like one, like a small club tournament and then do well on it. Or they're just like, hey, man. My daughter and my son came out. We went on that breakdown trip. I understood things a little better. I know how to use live scope and I caught it. All three of us are, you know, we can speak very highly in our ability to use live scope. So if you want to learn how to use it or get better with it, you can go out with any three of us and I guarantee you'll take something away from it, from any of us. Um, And yeah, and then we all offer follow up calls too. We can do calls without you going out with us the first time. Uh, I've done a few. Timmy jumped on one with me the other day and it, we do it for about an hour, but it usually goes on. I think me and Timmy went on for about two hours. Uh, he was a, he's a fantastic client or return client, and he wanted a follow-up breakdown. And he'd vouch for, for those calls as, as well as a few other people too. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I make a presentation, like a full-blown presentation, break it down, and get into every little detail on those calls. So if that's something that you're interested in just as an introductory and you don't really want to spend the time going out on one of our boats or us jumping into your boat to help you set up your live scope and show you the lake. Uh, those calls are, are a great, great way to get a lot of information and get out there and feel a little more confident. That and a lot of those people can use the information we give in those calls to go on the lake and figure out some of their own spots that we might mm-hmm. not have even covered. And other lakes too. Like a lot of the stuff that me and Timmy were, were talking about, you can take that knowledge to any single lake. I mean, r- really, like a lot of it is map reading and, and learning how really understanding a map and why these fish are setting up the way they do. Like, uh, you know, I can go on Smith Mountain and fish it pretty much looking at a map, looking for the same key areas on Smith Mountain, like what I did about two months ago and catch some really good fish. So it's not just something that's going to be helpful for Anna. It's going to be helpful for just about any body of water you fish that that is, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to say river. That's a completely different ballgame. But <laughs> if you're fishing like a highland, lowland reservoir, these these map tips and where the fish position, their seasonal progressions are going to help. Yeah, and I will say, if you can understand mapping, mapping is honestly, in my opinion, kind of more powerful than forward facing in a way. If you can really learn it, dial it in, it's it 100% is more powerful. We don't even need it to a point. People don't understand how how easy it is for somebody to break down a lake depending so like i got to fish 
I've been prefishing the tidal Rappahannock, and like the tide swings there compared to like the Potomac is insane. It rips, it really pulls. And if you're fishing a tile fisher like that, that's where 30 years of experience are important because you don't know when they're setting up at that lay down on a tide pull, what time, because the current can literally rip there to where like you can throw a three eighth ounce head and it ain't going straight to the bottom. And there's a time frame where they'll be there. There is nothing out there, forward facing center, or whatever, that will tell you like when that shit is. It's just experience. I mean, coach, you know, a, you know, SP fishing, like he knows on the chick when to be at certain spots because he's been there forever. And a lake is so cool where there's an equalizer. If you do the map study and you go out there and you graph, you can compete with people that have been there for a really long time, but you have to do your due diligence. You really do. Absolutely. SP, you've been quiet, so I'll let you do a little plug. You got anything coming up? What do we got coming up? Uh, just a bunch of uh, bunch of videos from the end of season kind of tournaments, the classics, championships, whatever you want to call them. Taking any trips for high pole guide service through probably like December, January. Might do a little Florida trip too at some point, but besides that, I think that's it's about it for the rest of the year. You got the uh, Rez McCluskey Donation Championship coming up soon? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Looking forward to it. That's actually when that glide bait bite was on fire last year. I caught, I want to say, like 15 fish on a glide in the, within the two days that all were in the bag. Maybe more. It was sick. So fun. And they're big, too. Well, I, I think he's got Potomac teams that same day, so I don't know if he'll even be there. Ooh. Oh, well, it's all right. Alex, his his tournament partner is super good too. I mean, as he he'll hold it down. Yeah, let us know in the chat below when this thing gets re up. Do you think McCluskey could fish the Res Championship or the Potomac Teams Championship? Let us know in the comment section where Matt where, where he should go. <laughs> he's, he's, in content, he's in contention for Potomac teams, uh, team of the year. Yeah, yeah. look at that. I, bless his heart. He said he's good at title fishing, and he actually is. I tip my cap to him. It's uh, it's hard to do both. It really is. At least from the friends I've talked to that just fished the Potomac, it's hard to make that switch and go light line on Lake Hanna or Smith. And if you can do both, my God, sky's the limit. He's an animal. That dude is just not like many others. <laughs> yeah, the Potomac teams, I mean, those are some fucking hammers too. So to be yeah. in contention for that, that's 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 good stuff. Yeah. Right on, guys. Well, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. If you would like to get a guided fishing trip with anyone here on the panel, link in the episode description to that as well. We are also going to have another Patreon uh, Patreon meetup this winter. I'm going to work that out where we're going to have rivers and we're going to have lakes. I know I got Chris Gorsh's for Susquehanna River that he's going to be coming down. Of course, Tyler will be back again for our next one as well. And hopefully I can kind of try to get like a Billy Coles up here as well, maybe. But that's going to be kind of in the December time before like the whole craziness of Christmas where you want to get away from your significant other and just chill, drink and talk fishing. I'll let you guys know about that as it comes up. If anything else, guys, please email me, like, and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.